Hey Art Freaks, so today I want to bring you a little tutorial art lesson. I kind of hate the word tutorial, but I think that's snobbery from having trained to be an art teacher. So we're going to say lesson on this type of lithographic process that uses a laser printer or any other toner based printer image as your lithograph plate. And quick overview. As you can see, it is typically, I don't know if you can use the word traditionally with this process, but traditionally, ordinarily, a very high contrast monochromatic form of printmaking. But as you can also see, I think, I have been playing recently with color. Now, when I was originally taught this, I was told that the only way you could get color prints is to make multiple photocopies of the same image and uh, basically cut them up, cut out what you wanted to stay, your base color, and print in layers like you do with, um, with like a relief image or a multicolored screen print. But these two were actually all off of the same plate. So all that color was off of the same photocopy. So we're going to do that. We're going to do this traditional um, Xerox lithography. And quick note about the name. Um, I don't know what exactly you call this. Everyone I meet that knows how to do this calls it something different. So it is technically a form of paper plate lithography. Uh, I was taught it in college. Maybe I discovered it in college. Uh, like we've discussed, I didn't have great print instructors, but I definitely did this a lot in my senior year and I knew it as Xerox lithography. A couple people, I've heard them refer to it as gum transfers. Uh, I've heard other people refer to it as paper plate lithography without any knowledge that there are other types of paper plate lithography. So it's a lithographic process. I, at this point in my life, kind of use Xerox litho and uh, gum transfer interchangeably. So. Don't get confused if you hear me refer to it both ways at some point. So, let me move aside the things and we'll talk about what we need to do I've this. got here that we're going to use today, and this is going to include the quick little studio tour that nobody ever asked for, is I've got Esmeralda out of storage. I know, she's a hot mess and I haven't washed my blanket in forever. Don't at me about it. Uh, citrus cleaner. I personally um, have discovered that I've become topically allergic to petroleum, so I am switching out anything petroleum based in my supplies. Uh, paper towels, these are just standard whatever was cheap at Dollar General because I can never convince my husband to buy quality paper towels, but these work. I've got cheap paints. What are these? These Royal and Langer Nickel, whatever they are. I guess I know Royal and Lang is a, considered a better brand in the UK, or at least I've heard that. And I don't know what it is that we get over here in the US, but these are cheapity cheap, cheap, cheap. Like I'm talking this whole set was a couple of bucks. Um, we've got our Tostitos jars, nor the dirty one over there. We don't need that one, but I got a nice clean one. I cleaned it just for you vegetable oil um, and our traditional litho inks back there. You can use them. Uh, and I've got part of my switching over to non-petroleum base is I picked up some Hanko inks and I don't know. I was always told that litho ink was extremely stiff. And I'm now starting to wonder if that was more a function of having very, very old ink in college. Because all the lithography inks I've ordered are actually 
fairly viscous. So this is, this Hanko ink is pretty new. Um, this is the sepia and I've got process black. Um, those are actually loose enough to use without the vegetable oil. I, I sometimes default to mixing a little vegetable oil in before I even try to roll them out on the paper. And then I remember that they don't need it and then it gets too loose and then I make a mess. And that's the story of how I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Why are you watching a video where I'm teaching you what to do? Anyway, got a brayer if you don't have an Esmeralda handy. Um, you can print with, this is my little, what is it? SD, um, all in one. The jingle is uh, some gouges in there for wood carving. This unscrews and becomes a, no, I'll just show you because I can just speed this up. Isn't that super cute how it becomes a gouge and it came with a couple different types? Um, I don't like this though, like these need to be sharpened badly. And I'm not like, I like a bigger handle so I actually prefer my speedball one to this. But I still thought that this whole Berin uh, carving tools system was cute. So if printmaking isn't your main jam, but you want to try this, if you don't even have a Berin handy and you don't want to buy one, you can use a spoon, um, like a wooden cooking spoon a lot of people use. I don't like printing with a spoon when I'm hand printing because the curvature, I don't know, I, just, I end up with lines. I'm not good at hand printing with a spoon. I could never get the hang of it. I have, though, used... Um, this is my little alter alternative brayer. It's a jar candle lid, and this has a bigger flat surface than the back of a spoon. So I like printing with this guy actually kind of a lot. Uh, razor scraper for cleaning up. This is a glass top table, if you couldn't tell by the light's reflection right about there. Um, it's just... A regular table and the glass is duct taped to it. This came out of an old window at our trailer. It's so it's just junky float glass and uh, I had a former professor who told me it would never work and I've been using it for eight years so this actually works surprisingly well. A uh, clean unblemished plexi will work too. It'll be you won't be able to scrape it though so it'll be a little bit harder to clean up. I also have I think it's outside right now a smaller window glass that's still got its like weather stripping stuff around it um and then taped edges and that's my little that's my travel inking station uh tostitos jar with water gum arabic which i need to reorder this is the one thing you can't really get cheaply for this process uh, there might be cheaper places to get it than graphic chemical, graphic chemical and ink. But I like them. They're my favorites. So they are where I get my gum arabic from. Brayer, you can skip this if you're not going to roll the ink out. And if you know anything about printmaking, you're now wondering what in the hell I'm talking about. And we're going to get into that with the tutorial. But... I would recommend, because this is not that expensive, but this is a hard rubber one. Get, uh, or well, I mean, it's not like it's like plastic, but it's a harder rubber one. Uh, don't get the foam ones. They're cheap. They're not good. They don't last very long. I had one once and it fell apart on me. Um, palette knife. Obviously, it doesn't have to be amazing. I would personally, I like to mix ink with a, a palette knife with a sharper edge but this will work just fine and I feel like I'm forgetting something oh yeah what you're going to print your images off of so any toner based printing machine will work so a toner based laser printer a toner based photocopier uh, previously, I would go and run my copies off at Staples. 
And there is something nice about using a more traditional photocopier that I'll touch on again in a second. But at the moment now, I have recently acquired this guy right here. I don't remember. Oh, there it is. There's the number. No, you can't see that, can you? Because it's really dark. That ID tag on it says LaserJet M1212NF. So I've already exper experimented with this a little bit. It's great. The thing with this method is that your photocopies that you're going to ink up and print need to either be fresh, like barely cooled down, or they need to be old. There is no in-between, and there is no... I, I personally don't know how to tell the difference other than experimenting and failing. So with this guy, we need to print them fresh. So I'm going to print off new ones for this little lesson but your mileage may vary if it doesn't work for you with fresh photocopies then try letting them printing them off and letting them sit for a little while if you let them sit for a little while like i'd say like a week i mean it doesn't you can let them sit for like a day and try it in a couple days um but i know that this guy definitively anything a week old or longer is garbage I can't use. I haven't tried anything in between like an hour and a week. Um, I only ended up trying the week old ones by accident when I because I went on vacation. But yeah, so if your process doesn't work, if your ink doesn't adhere, if you can't get a lot of ink to adhere, if your image seems to be washing away, try altering the age of your photocopy. So what you're going to do once you have an image, a photograph, is you're going to open it in GIMP, you're going to open Chrome alongside it and listen to, you know, your favorite YouTuber or stimulus check updates. Make sure it's really key that you have about 100 tabs open because otherwise, if you don't have all those tabs open, you might not not get distracted while you're working and then are you even alive at that point if you're not distracted by every other thing in the universe while you're trying to work so i like to use um some of my own photography but also a lot of vintage photos so got a little selection laid out from my digital collection of old photos um now, for a rolled out monochromatic, the usual way, Xerox Litho, you want to take your image and you're going to, first of all, desaturate it because we're printing the plate in black and white, so the color doesn't matter and it's, you have a better idea of what you're going to end up with if you start out monochromatic. You're then for a traditional monochromatic, going to want to fiddle with the contrast and some of the filters. Let me get a little better centered there. Until you have something like this. Uh, not exactly like this, I'm not a huge fan. Like all this little boxiness, that has the potential to print. So, but it's this very high contrast because what you have to remember is any toner on your paper is going to resist water and attract ink. So you want really high contrast so that you're reducing the amount of toner on the paper. And you want to, any tones that you want to save, you've got to try like in there with the, sh with the, the gown. I didn't, wasn't able in that go around to preserve the patterning, but I could preserve the tone. And in order to do that, you have to sort of pixelate it. So I usually in eight years ago, Photoshop and GIMP, did a lot of the um, unsharp mask filter, but in I recently discovered that GIMP and Photoshop uh, actually has a photocopy filter. So let me cancel this one. So this is one I think I prepped this probably like eight years ago, and then I just never really did anything with it. So. I will print this guy 
and we'll look at when you're using the sharpen and unsharpen mask filters in conjunction with the contrast and brightness how it looks and I print usually a minimum of two copies because we're going to be getting wet which means the paper is going to have the potential to rip so let's go a little smaller than five by seven so it'll fit on my paper i know you can't see my printer dialog right now but all i've done is i've selected my laser jet because my canon is an ink jet ink jet absolutely positively will not work don't try this at home kids because there is no way to get an inkjet to work it's just has to do with the difference between what inkjet ink is made from and what toner is made from and how it's applied to the paper so i've got two copies i'm going to do uh, i've got printing straight from gimp under image settings i've made it a little bit smaller than five by seven so that i can fit it on my little five by seven paper uh, change setup is just what paper tray to come out of. We're going to do one sided, obviously. It's going to be portrait because this image is portrait. Um, nothing really that needs to be done with any of the other settings, past image settings, to make sure you get the size you want. So, you'll do that. Here's my original. And what I'm going to do with this to prep it for a colored image is actually not a lot. So because we are applying colored inks to toners, we're going to have some blending capabilities, which means we don't need to have the extreme high contrast that we had here. So I'm gonna go into colors and I'm gonna go to hue saturation. I'm going to completely desaturate it. We still don't need that color tone on there and then I'm gonna go back to colors and I'm gonna go to brightness contrast and I'm actually just going to bump it up a bit I want to pull some whites out of there and you could go do a whole thing like I could go in with my pencil and I could draw some lines in there to redarken them if I wanted to but I'm not concerned about that right now just for what I personally want to do if you wanted there to still be the little shadow of her gown in there then you could totally just eyedropper I would eyedropper something a little dark because even if it's a toner black and white the way excuse me because it's not a super high contrast printer is I will get a grayscale it's actually not a black and white print it's a grayscale print um, which is why I need to bump the contrast and get rid of some of those light 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 grays because I don't want any toner on the paper there so you could totally oh my goodness that is huge uh, where was her yeah you could totally go and draw a little gown line there so but that's up to you I'm not gonna take a ton of time right now to alter this although I actually do think I like having a little line of the gown there so we'll leave that for now but all I did was just play with the contrast a little bit to get some more I'm actually maybe even gonna bump it up just a little more There we go. And now I'm going to do the same thing. Oh, 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 okay. One thing I almost forgot real quick is because this is a, um, this is not a right reading printing process. The only right reading printing process to my knowledge is screen printing. So this is a mirror image process, meaning that our finished product is going to be flipped. now. This is the uh, original photograph's original orientation. So if I want to maintain this, uh, you just need to go and flip it horizontally. 
so that it, you print out your photocopy backwards, but then that prints your um, final print the right way. And if you include any text, because, I mean, we're in GIMP, like, go hog wild, do whatever you want. Throw some text in there if you want. But you make sure that you add the text and then flip the image so that your text is backwards when you print it, but right reading when you ink it up and print the final copy. So, same dealy. I'm going to go print, and I'm probably going to speed you up while I listen to the tax man. Tell me about those sweet, sweet Uncle Sam bucks. Okay, so I've got my stack of prints. They've sat for a little bit, they've cooled down. So they are gonna be good to go. Next thing I wanna do is mix up my gum Arabic water. So I do, <laughs> if I tip it, you can't see how full the jar is. I do like a 50-50, maybe a little bit more. It, kind of depends on um, what kind of ink you're using as to how slick you need it to be and what your toner does. So this is going to be slightly more water than gum arabic because I know that I don't need it from using this, this toner before. I know that I don't need it as slick as... Um, I have in the past with some other printers. And sometimes as your gum Arabic gets old, you'll start to notice like some of it separating a little bit. I just give it a shake before I pour it in. Um, I was posting these on a Discord the other day and explaining the process to somebody and they said it sounded like more like alchemy than art and I gotta say like I collect glass jars I mix weird chemicals together I've always referred to myself as a mad scientist when I do printmaking but I actually do definitely feel more than a little witchy so quick little stir and then we are going to prep the ink. So first I'm going to show you how to do it monochrome rollout style. And there might be a couple of quick cuts here because I'm using my Gorilla Pod and I can't decide how, what direction I want the camera to be. So right now we're going to keep it like this, but you'll probably get jumbled around a little bit. Sorry. So for a traditional monochromatic rolled out ink, what we're gonna do is you will need your lithography ink or, or cheap paint. When it comes to the rollout method, I have used the cheap paint for the rollout <laughs> method too. Um, because you need your, your ink to be a little bit more viscous than um, other types of printmaking ink. Definitely not, e not anything near as stiff as etching ink. That wouldn't even work. That would probably rip your toner straight off your paper. And not as stiff as uh, block printing ink. So 
But like I said, the Hanko ink, when it's fairly new, I have found does not need to be um, thinned out at all. So I'm just going to take a little bit with my palette knife. And if you know, if you've print, printed in the past, you know that we take our palette knives and we get a little roll here started of ink up at the top. If not, if this is new to you, just get a little bit of ink on the edge of your palette knife and then draw it out. And then to prep the brayer, we're going to um, roll it in the ink, but we're going to roll and lift and roll and lift. Part of that is to make sure we get the brayer evenly coated. Also part of it is that my brayer is, I don't even know what it's bent. Or it's stuck it's gummed up somewhere I'm not entirely certain what's going on with it but I uh, it doesn't roll as smoothly I don't think it shows up on camera but it's it's a little sticky it doesn't roll as smoothly as it's supposed to so that being the case it's even more important that I pick up and roll to make sure that I'm getting an even coat so And you also want to roll in different directions to get a nice even coat. Any voids that you see in the ink on the glass are voids in the ink on your brayer. So make sure that you're rolling it out nice, flat, and even. And if you can hear, um, yeah. So, any other printmaker, a block printmaker, that is definitely not sounding sticky and stiff enough, but that is the perfect sound for this type of lithography. Um, jump cut. So now wiping the plate, inking it up, is just a back and forth of getting it wet, seeing where the ink is loose, seeing where the ink isn't attached, and then running the ink over. In a traditional stone lithography, to get an ink, you build up the ink in very thin layers, and you roll in a bunch of different directions. We're going to do something extremely similar here. So you can use a rag, I'm just going to use a paper towel, but I like to start by dipping in my gum arabic water and wetting the back of my paper. And I honestly just find that this helps you lay it out flatter for inking. So turn it right side out. And if you were to let this dry, it would adhere to your glass it would be unadhered with water or with scraping, but it would adhere to your glass. So remembering that gum arabic is a glue, we're going to always endeavor to keep our paper wet, like thoroughly saturated. And you can see I'm just, I don't even know why I'm being like timid on camera, but you really just slop it down. I mean, you don't need like a pool of water there, but you do need like you can see the color of the paper changed because of how saturated it is or maybe you can't on camera but I can see that the color of the paper changed so and let me see if I can get you close enough to see that the resist action is already starting to happen like there we go you see how the gum arabic solution beads up on the toner and away so that is the money shot right there that is what we need that's how we know that we have something that's going to work if you don't know that your printer is inkjet or toner based first of all i don't know how you would not know that because toner is kind of expensive but um that beading won't happen on an inkjet because the ink sinks into the paper so we know we've got the right 
matrix all set up. So now we're going to um, just back and forth. We're going to roll and you really need a gentle touch on this. If you go heavy handed, you can tear the surface off of it, tear your toner right off of your paper. That'll also happen if it's not, um, if it gets too old to use, it'll start to tear. Uh, I've also seen it with printers, with toners that need time to set, like they need like that week to set down on the paper. It'll tear off if it's not ready yet, but I think I mentioned earlier, I've, I've already played with this printer's toner, so I know what I can get away with. So I'm just going to start rolling across. And you can see there's the stickiness of the sprayer. And you can see though, that the ink is not adhering to the paper, I can just take my wet paper towel and wipe it away. And so I'm going to keep doing this. This is um, just sort of a back and forth thing. You partly get kind of a feel for it if you're using black ink on black toner and so you can't really see the color change. But one of the benefits of using colored ink is that you can see the ink applying on top of the toner so you'll be able to tell this sepia is really dark so it's not as easy to tell as a lot of colored inks but you also kind of get a feel for it after you've done it a while enough times and i'm doing the four directions i'm not doing the traditional eight of stone lithography part of that is laziness Part of that is that I've never really found it necessary to do all eight directions. I mean, like you can, obviously, but that didn't really do much for me with this, the, the other, um, that just doing four directions didn't. So once you start to get some of these blooms, if you noticed, I, uh, I was getting some blooming not just from the ink that I haven't wiped away yet, but from the lines themselves, like the where my toner is. So that means that I am good and inked up, or at least I should be under the appropriate amount of pressure. So we're gonna wipe away all of our excess here. And you can see as I'm like wiping over the top of this dark area, more little flecks of ink are coming out so I am really good and well in inked up. Maybe even a little too inked up because it's going to be hard to control the plate tone when you have this much wandering around but I can always speed up this wiping process. You can also blot with a wet paper towel or wet rag. And then I'm just, I'm so gentle with this. I'm so light-handed. And this was, I'm like a very heavy-handed person. So this is the hardest part of this process for me. This is guaranteed the hardest part of this process for anybody I've ever taught, really. And not positive, but I think I might have lost some toner in some spots here. But I'm just losing patience and want to move on with my life because this isn't even a print that I particularly care about, or I'm going to particularly care about, so I kind of just want to print it to show you. So I'm going to turn off the camera, very carefully transfer this to the plate, the press bed, and wet some paper to print on. So I've transferred my plate to my print bed. It should have something covering the print bed, like there should be an in-between layer to protect the print bed, yada, yada, yada. The channel name is The Naughty Printmaker. I don't know why you're surprised. Um, and I apologize, I couldn't show, I can't show everything right now as I'm filming this. I have a sprained ankle and I'm rolling around in an office chair, so that makes things a little awkward. But I've got a water tub down here that I soaked my paper in. So I'm gonna give it a little shake. I just personally, for this paper, and for this process, prefer my paper a little damper. 
I'm using um, Sustainable Paper and Craft, Kelsey Pikes. I think this is from the Reject bundle, or not Reject, what should you call it, Imperfect, I don't know. But it's a, it's a cotton paper. It's pretty wet, but it's not dripping. And I'm just gonna lay it down there. I'm gonna get some computer paper to lay over the top to absorb my excess moisture. And blank it down. I don't keep this bolted into my desk so that I can move it around a little bit easier. So I just gotta give it a whole Desmeralda down or she goes jumping all over the place. And I'm shaking the, the pressure is enough that it's shaking the whole table as it moves. So it's also shaking the camera. So I hope you enjoyed that little shaky cam moment. Uh, I've got some excess water here on the bed because I didn't put down a layer to protect it, which is fine. It's fine. We're all fine here. I do clean my bed regularly, and you have to if you're using a press and you're not protecting the bed. You have to clean it regularly because, again, gum arabic is glue, and it just won't end well to have a sticky press bed. There it is. So it's got kind of that pixelated, grainy, old, high contrast photo quality. It actually, I think what attracted me to this initially is that um, in its most extreme, highest contrast state, it reminds me of the movie Begotten. And I love that movie a lot. And I was watching it a ton while I was learning how to do this process. So that is the traditional monochromatic um, method. I'm going to show you real quick why we have to use such high contrast um, images and then we'll talk about the color method that I've been playing with. I forgot. So most of the time these are not inkable a second time uh, like with a relief block, a block of wood you can just keep inking it and print off and you have a large edition. This is more of a monotyping situation um, I have re-inked a photocopy before. One of my professors swears that when she learned this in college, they uh, lacquered the back of the paper. Uh, I've not found that useful because you can't lacquer the face of the paper or you lose the resistance. And the toner and the surface of the paper because we're printing on copier paper breaks down over time. So. If there's a laser printer that could print on like a watercolor paper that was really sized well but still absorbent so not sized too much, I, I guess it's like theoretically possible to produce a plate from which you could pull an extensive edition, but I mean that also loses some of the charm, right, because in its basic, most basic form, we're playing with the limitations of the photocopier to create new images and new types of images and new art. So the turning the photocopier that mass produces things but degrades them over time into a one of a kind piece of art, but then turning that back into multiple copies I don't know, there's there's a lot of art philosophy there that you could dive into. But the point I almost forgot that I wanted to make is you can pull what's called a ghost print from these most of the time. So your mileage is going to vary based on your paper, based on your ink application the first time around, based on whether you're printing with a press or by hand. Uh, I personally cannot produce enough pressure to get a decent ghost print. Um, thinner paper is always going to get a better print than a thicker paper, so I would always do a first print on like whatever your thicker paper is, and then if you have some rice paper around, you can try to pull a ghost on that. Uh, you can print on fabric, and if I remember to, I will show you that in a minute. I would always print on fabric first, and I would always print on fabric as a monochrome, but not... I mean, this image looks like it's already deteriorated on me, so not on this image. But I will print this on some copier paper to show you what it's like. 
as ghost print. So I just gave my plain Jane computer paper a quick dunk in there. And I'm not the most concerned in the world with registration. I am trying to get my paper to be flat. Um, if you've done any other kind of printmaking before, then you know that wrinkles will print. I feel like that can be very interesting here. Uh, I am most intrigued by it when I do print on fabric. I like to sometimes wrinkle the fabric or I'll put like a layer of lace on it. So the wrinkles can be interesting. It just occurred to me I can push you back a little bit and then maybe you won't shake as much and maybe you'll still see it. And I would definitely do more passes on a ghost print. Like you want to try to suck off every little last bit of ink that you can out of that on the second or third print. Um, rarely do I get to three. I usually, it's one good print and then it's a ghost print. junk paper. This is junk paper. So yeah, Kelsey's paper is really good, really absorbent, and it just does what it's supposed to do. So I don't have much in the way of ink left on this. But you can see this one really puts the ghost in ghost print. But sometimes in its own way, the ghost print can be a little bit clearer. Like I might actually, I've got another copy of this. I might go and print it on like this copy paper and then try printing it on Kelsey's because I do like some of the quality. It's lost some of its harsh pixelization you're losing the kid's face over here but I almost like that a ghost print will also give you a good idea of how it's going to print on fabric because um and again this depends on your fabric weave and everything but even with a very tightly woven fabric it's always a little bit fuzzier you lose a little detail compared to printing on paper Actually, let's do that I'm going to try printing the same image on fabric and my fabric of choice 90% of the time is um, vintage handkerchiefs, 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 I have no idea how you say that word, but they're cute and they're small and I like to print on them and they're usually got a fairly, where the hell are you camera? Oh, you're right there. Uh, are you going to focus at all? Maybe, maybe not. But they usually, a vintage hanky usually has a fairly decently tight weave to it, so. I'm going to ink this. This is a fresh one. I'm going to ink it back up and then we're going to print on some fabric. It isn't necessary to mix up and repull the ink every time. I just wanted to add a little red to the sepia so I have to mix the red Just in. talking and working and I have no idea what you missed but um, I have some plate tone going on this. And I was talking most recently before I went to go move this onto the press is that I, I am actually a person that kind of likes plate tone, but it also, I know from experience, tends to not show up as much on fabric as it does on paper. So I'm gonna let this go despite some crazy plate tone happening because I definitely way over inked this. So I'm gonna move over to the bed. That. We're gonna flip you around so you can see the press. And just like, sorry, you're falling over. Actually, I'm gonna set you up here so that you don't shake when I print. Just like with the paper, I'm gonna wet this.
for my press, because of the limitations of my press bed. I'll have to fold this in a little bit. And it looks like the, um, the edging of this was done when the fabric was not stretched. So I'm going to do my best to flatten it out here. And grab some junky paper. I hope you're still with me. And that the camera didn't decide to shut off again. You there? Yeah, you're there. Cool. <laughs> can tell that the fabric where I fold it over makes it just a little bit thicker than the paper. That's why I got that jump just now. I really should bolt Esmeralda into the table, but I don't want to leave a permanent system for that on my desk. Um, this could be solved by getting a floor press or getting a dedicated table for her, but you know, tiny apartment, I do what I can. Their backing. Pretty good indication. That bleed through is a pretty good indication that we got a decent print. So, if you're ready for the big reveal. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Check her out. So, this is actually a much crisper print than I usually get on fabric and it has to do with what tight a weave it is. Um, you can still see some of the pixelation that we could see on paper but we are also losing like our, our kid is getting lost into the background here over here which I really enjoy. Uh, could have done without the haloing under the chin but you know there is no such thing as a perfect print when you wear the naughty printmaker. So now that I've pulled this on fabric, fabric will never absorb as much of the ink as paper. So I'm actually going to go and wet another piece of Kelsey's paper and pull another paper print of this. If everything is going to cooperate with me. I grabbed a white because it is going to be a ghost print. So the lighter the paper, the better chance it has of showing up full strength and see how much my registration sucks there. You can see the embossing, the hanky actually embossed my my protection layer, that's funny. <laughs> A ghost print that is a damn fine print it's pulled out a lot of detail still so this is what I was saying uh, a ghost print if you're gonna print on paper and fabric definitely make your real print on fabric and your ghost print on the paper because you're going the fabric will never get as much even if it's a really liquidy like that's or a really um like absorbent I don't think I've ever printed on wool, but linen, cotton, definitely the polyesters, they just can't absorb the ink the way, the same way that paper can. So you'll always get a really good quality, a print that doesn't even necessarily look like a ghost print if you print on fabric first and then on the paper. First, I want to show you why we need the super high contrast. So this image I printed out, uh, for the color process, I'm going to roll it as a monochrome though so you can see what happens. And it's harder to tell that now that it's wet, but this is all toner. The whole thing is toner all over it. There's no white of the paper in the whole square of the image. Oh, 
There it is. I lost some of the toner. I didn't even notice. Huh. I wonder why that was. Okay, yeah, the toner is so thick I'm not even going to be able to ink this properly because it's just pulling up. But we will print what we've got. See, I can't even like wipe it properly because the ink is just re-adhering to that gray. see how much water was still in this plate because I couldn't blot it properly. I just lifted up and sort of shook the gum arabic and ink off of it. It's because nothing wants to ink right when it's um, got too much toner on it. Yeah, so like it's not the worst in the world. This is actually of a not contrasty enough photocopy. This is actually the best print I've ever gotten. And I'm not super mad at this, but you see that like the plate tone, when you've got a thin layer of toner covering, when you don't have any paper white to work with, the plate tone is uncontrollable. And I'm actually, though I'm kind of mad because it's got sort of like a weird spooky look to it. I'm a little bit mad that I did this on junky paper. I'm going to see if I can pull a decent ghost on good paper. It just seems like one of those things where like what was supposed to be the mess up printed really good and now it won't print like that again. Oh, it's not the worst. It's not the worst. It's not what we got on the crappy paper, but it's not the worst. I have absolutely no idea why the toner just lifted in those areas. And this just looks like bad rolling right there. But it's a little spooky. I dig it. And then super quick, we'll go over hand printing. So everything, all the prep, all the lead up is all the same. Same ink that I've been using, same gum Arabic solution. Same amount of wetness. I think with the other two, I was getting those two that ripped, I was getting like really heavy handed. Oh, and here you go. Here's a good example like this. Definitely. I printed this for the color method. This has got way too much toner on it. I'm losing so much. So this will be a much better example for you of why you need paper white. But. 
Now, the thing with hand printing is that unless you're like a bodybuilder and you can get the same amount of pressure as a press onto the paper with your hand, you're never going to get as crisp and dark as a print. You're never going to get as much, you can lose some detail from hand printing with this method. Not That's not necessarily true of um, like block printing, but you won't get as much plate tone with hand printing as you will with printing from a press. So, oh man, I just wish I had some good like 9 by 12 paper to print some of these weird things on. That's Tracy paper. Where's all my paper? Here we go, let's try this. They have some Fabriano Tiziano. Tiz Tiziano. I don't know how to pronounce Italian words. I took French. But let's try this. I'm gonna get it wet just like I did the for the press. I'm going to do my best to center it because I think I might end up with something kind of cool. But two, I gotta sneeze. I'm gonna put some paper back in to protect it. Um, just like I did on the press. Pretty sure I just moved it, we'll live. And then I'm gonna take my brayer, and everybody is a little bit different with how they hand print. I personally just like to start in center, and I just circles. I just do circles all the way around. Um, there's a saying with print breaking, I think it's when it applies to when you're grinding all the stone is to let the center attend to itself, but I do not find that to be a good philosophy with hand printing. And you can see I've just got so much water right now. I am so saturated that I don't usually do this, but I am actually going to take a paper towel and sop up some of this. And uh, for those playing our home game, I am definitely rushed before I have to go pick up my husband right now trying to get this filming in. Whoops. Guess I got a little bit too distracted earlier by the YouTubes. But, yeah. Back and forth after I do my little circles. All the directions. And your strokes should be overlapping so that you uh, you don't end up, like I was talking about with, um, with a spoon, using a spoon, how you can end up with some lines. That comes from unevenly applied pressure. And with a spoon, I find that I have trouble with unevenly applied pressure because of the shape of the spoon. When I'm using a nice flat barin like this, it happens from not overlapping your strokes and having just craziness everywhere. So the nice thing with hand printing is that you can give yourself a little sneak a peek. Now, if this was thinner paper, which I usually actually always suggest thinner paper with hand printing because of the, um, the thinner paper automatically soaks up more detail. Um, if this was thinner paper, I'd be able to gauge by my ink bleed to the other side how I was doing. But I don't have that, so I'm gonna just lift up the littlest corner. And that actually looks like a pretty decent print we've got. So, I will peel back some more. And I'm liking what I'm seeing, so I'm peeling it back all the way. And... There you have it, my friends. 
a hand printed. A lot of these lines should disappear as the paper dries. We'll find out if they don't, I guess. And now I could totally run this through my press um, to get a decent ghost print. I could try printing on thin paper by hand to get a decent so, ghost print. Quick word about how to clean up. We're gonna use, when you're all done, the paint scraper to pull up the ink. I'm not actually gonna clean up this whole space right now because I'm gonna be doing some more printing in a little bit, but you're going to get as much of the ink up with the paint scraper as you can. And then you'll get your little razor scraper friend to get the bits. There will also be probably some dried gum arabic in there. The razor scraper is really great for getting that off the glass too. And then we'll spray with our oil cleaner degreaser of choice and you'll just spray the whole situation. You'll take the roller to clean the roller, the brayer. You're going to just roll it out and you'll see ink start to, it doesn't want to do it right now because I haven't cleaned the gum arabic off of this part of the thing yet, but you'll start to see ink come off of it. Again, it's not worth me cleaning right now because I'm going to print in a little bit. You'll see the ink start to come off of it. Once you can't roll off any more ink, then you'll want to spray it with your degreaser and a rag and give it a good, good scrub down to get everything off of it. Your goal should be to return your brayer to its original color every time you use it, which I'm really bad about that. So mine has a very distinctive gray-brown tinge at this point. And then if you have a lot of ink left over up here, you can lay out a sheet of plastic wrap and wrap it up to keep it from drying out and reuse it again. Um, even if you haven't mixed a custom color, with this process I 100 million percent would say do not put it back in the pot. Um, because you do get gum arabic uh, contamination and toner contamination in the ink and you don't want to contaminate your entire pot of ink. So I never put ink from a Xerox litho back into the pot. If it's worth saving, I save it. Also, honestly, most of the time I'll just print till I'm almost out of ink and then use the last little cleanup scraps to do um, some other type of monotyping. So yeah, cleanup is, oh, and then for your hands, just use a, um, like a really good quality, a Dawn or a Dial dish soap and after I've been printing for a few days, I usually notice some ink buildup, like in my nail, around my nails, under my nails. I just use um, Gojo, like the grainy type of Gojo that you get from the auto store, to uh, get all that, scrape all that grease and everything away. So yeah, cleanup's uh, it's a little bit of a messy process, but cleanup is pretty straightforward as long as you've got good degreasing cleaners to use. Yeah, there you have it. That is monochrome. Uh, Xerox lithography that is the traditional Xerox lithography so I'm going to cut it here and I will make a second video tonight if I have the light or tomorrow morning about color and I'll post that up next week so I'm not gonna tell you to comment or like or subscribe or any of that stuff because I don't tell you how to live your life except I realize that sometimes I do tell you how to live your life like when I yell at you to wear a mask or that Black Lives Matter, but I don't tell you how to live your life on YouTube. So you do you, and I will see you for the second part of the lesson next time. Have a great day. Go on an adventure. Go art something. Wear a mask while you're doing it. Black Lives Matter. I'll talk to you later. Bye.